So Jaka, uh, I think I think it would be great uh, to to uh, hear a little bit about your childhood uh, and and your family and 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 how did you you know what what was it like growing as a child? Uh, if you could share something around that. To hear that uh, you you is it is it well, let me let me re rephrase this um, the kind of experience a person has as a child uh, you think it has a it has a huge bearing on the humility on the aggression ambition uh, that a person develops over a period of time or do you think it's immaterial it, it develops at a later age. I remember going to the course Science of Happiness a couple of years back, and that is where I, I picked up on following you quite avidly. Uh, 
I remember one of the sections in the course uh, was about uh, how parents act as the first justice system within the family because the child you invariably have the child uh, uh, you know wanting something and, uh, and and if there are siblings then there is sibling rivalry and lot of fights happening among sibling and sort of parents trying to settle in 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 the family you think that is a huge huge bearing on how fairness is perceived in 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 the world and how how uh, less is more or how delayed gratification is is instituted in 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 the character of the person uh, i think you know i mean him out thanks for bringing that literature out i mean i think that it's fundamental and we know we have some hints of it in the scientific literature so you know the literature you're talking about and it's so fascinating it's for the parents out there that you know you raise your kids you have this family and one message from the scientific literature is siblings are going to fight you know they're going to get into conflicts in the united states it's you know two and four year old siblings are getting into conflicts six ten times a day right they're just scratched just getting into tangles about toys and food and space and you know and so when those things happen um just as you're very wisely suggesting this is when parents teach their kids about morality and justice right and you can teach your child through language and reflection and almost the socratic method of thinking about your emotions and your your you know you you're teaching them things like do people deserve the very same amount of equality uh you're teaching children things like actually you can wait until you get your ice cream right the way of gratification like you said so the really interesting message from this work by Judy Dunn is that our sense of morality and justice comes out of these family conversations right do you cite somebody as a child really struggles with identity do you give them inspiring people to think about right or even you know different cultural traditions or myths or legends um as is common in hinduism so this is the massive opportunity for parents to shape their children but it's not in a didactic way of like this is the fourth truth of the world more is in wow we're really you're fighting with your sister let's think this through and what really matters here so it's a wonderful literature interesting <laughs> um can you share a couple of or at least an anecdote that you you tried to apply this in in your own parenting <laughs> oh man you know so uh yeah you know i i think uh i'm sure there are many but uh, it's difficult when you ask for something so oh uh, it was it was the defining theme of my early parenting of my daughters you know um and the you know i remember um you know one time um uh you know i just i remember uh i mean the, the deeper lesson that i had to really um embrace and and this, you know again this is for the the, the studies that i'm talking about are largely about western european families so you always have to think about culture and this particular culture and shape these kind of these uh, insights but um you know i remember uh the we were on this trip and um uh, i was trying to drive my kids somewhere and my two daughters had this way of they when they would play together they were tiny at the time they had these really interesting characters that they would take on and they pretended that they had a radio show and they were just really annoying two characters Holly and Dolly you know they had these weird laughs and stories and they're doing this show and it was driving me nuts <laughs> and you know because it was loud and disruptive and I'm driving and uh, I tried like you know really a problem you know like stop you know well <laughs> you know you're not going to do that and I didn't reason through it then and their characters became more uh you know more subversive and made fun of me and uh and I think that you know what we talk about in the developmental literature of raising moral kids is to really get them to reason through what's going on and to reflect on the situation 
situation and other people's emotions. And when a parent blurs out, you know, like, don't do that, you know, at least in, in many different contexts today, uh, you're more, you're better served by getting the kids to reason through it and reflect on it. And, and uh, so it was a humbling lesson. And there were many, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sure. Uh, it, it would also be interesting to hear about your uh, teenage years. I remember, you know, the first uh, the first time I saw you on the course, uh, the thing that struck about you was uh, a very very nice personality that you have. And as you were as you were growing as a teenager, how is it like growing as a teenager uh, when you have so many pressures? You have peer pressure. You you are into your first love. Most of the time, I mean, most of us go through our first love experiences during that time, and then also the society uh, puts a pressure and tells you that you need to identify your strength and build on it as a career. How is it for you? You know, these different peer pressure, first love, finding strength. Uh, how did you tackle that? Yeah, you know, um, I I would say. Um, you know, my, uh, my teenage years um, were there, they were marked, um, and they, I am a, you know, genetically, if you were able, if we knew how to profile anxiety, there's a lot of anxiety that runs through my family, and I was pretty clearly an anxious, unhappy teenager, um, and then adding to that was uh, my junior year in high school, so a couple of years before I went to college, my family went to England, and we went to this really brutal school, this working class school, where I was bullied for about five or six months, really viciously, and, and really in a humbling way, um, and then my parents divorced, so I had just like, you know, we know from the social scientific literature that, you know, if you're parents split up um, in the our way, which my parents did, at a critical period, like your junior year in high school, your a lot of stuff becomes chaotic. And, you know, it, it was really interesting, um, but I was lucky in that my parents encouraged me to pursue, I would almost call it a spiritual path of reading Buddhism, you know, starting to read Hinduism, um, getting interested in meditation as a 16-year-old, 17-year-old, um, looking to get outside into nature and finding the wisdom of natural patterns, um, reading about the indigenous peoples of, you know, sort of South and North America um, and their wisdom. And, and so my parents... Even though there's a lot of chaos and stress in my own psyche, they gave this to me, right? And, you know, as, as you know, it's been a lifelong pursuit is to think about where does compassion come from? Where do you find it? Where does awe come from? Where does epiphany and deep insights and gratitude and reverence, right? The things that spiritual traditions have taken 2,500 years to really capture uh, even though I wasn't a religious person and my parents, we didn't have any religious practice or spiritual practice, my parents were saying, go on this path, right? Find the deep meaning in your life, even though it's chaotic in our family. Um, and that, I can't tell you, you know, between the ages of 16 and 21, when my family life was chaotic, I was digging into Taoism and Buddhism and, you know, Hinduism and, and trying things in yoga in particular, and it changed my life. It truly um, changed my life. Amazing. Amazing. Um, I want to dive into your a couple of things that, that actually three of them. One is the Greater Good Science, the Greater Good Science Center. Uh, the second, the second is your uh, work with uh, your work as the as the advisor to the movie, the blockbuster Pixar movie Inside yeah. Out, and the third is yeah. Power Paradox. So, okay. which one would you like to go first? Well, let's talk about the center. Okay, <laughs> please go. Um, yeah. How, how did you describe, how did that whole journey begin? Uh, what led you yeah. to that? Well, you know, it's, in, 
interesting. Um, so it was 2001, and um, the you know we've just experienced the 9/11 attacks uh, in the United States. There's a lot of like there is at this moment. There was a lot of anxiety and worry and concern about who we are as a culture. And then um, a couple of people who went to UC Berkeley, where I teach, and where the Greater Good Science Center is, um, their daughter had died young, and so they wanted to give some money. Uh, Tom and Ruth Ann Hornaday, because of the, their own grief, uh, to promote peace in the world. And so I was appointed to kind of build something out of that aspiration. And I think where, where it really began to amount is that, you know, we were starting in 2001 to get a picture scientifically of how important mindfulness is or gratitude or how when we practice kindness and compassion, our nervous system looks healthier and the people around us look healthier, right? There were just all these kind of initial glimmerings or pictures of how important those things are for our communities and ourselves. And, and we had this choice, you know, to like do what's traditional at the university, which is to fund science and write papers, or to really do something that reaches people, right? To get outside of the walls of the university. And um, and it was really clear to me, and I think this traces back to my past of, you know, if you have the privilege to study things and to learn, like I do as a professor, um, you. You know, it's good to serve other people with that knowledge. Um, and so we hired Jason Marsh. Uh, we built a magazine. We created a magazine. It did really well. That then led to a website um, to promote these ideas in really good, rigorous prose the greater, at greatergood.berkeley.edu. That grew exponentially. And then, you know, since then, not only were we funding scientists and fellows, but we're also, we, we gather teachers together, we're getting healthcare providers together uh, in institutes. We have people like you, you know, who are so important to us who are saying, I'll build this myself in organizations in India, right? And we have that going on around the world. And I think that the key idea, alongside our commitment to this science of goodness, is is to empower people, right? Is to say, this is what we know, and this is what you can do with it. Now you go build, you're working in a, a school in Brazil, you go ahead and, and build something out of this. Or you are um, leading government officials in Scotland, you do something with this. So we're really, it's, it's kind of a grassroots type way of, of disseminating. And you know, I'm not, I've been lucky to have amazing experiences in my career, and uh, you know, the Greater Good Science Center is the, uh, it gives me the most goosebumps when I'm thinking about what it does and, you know, what, what its promises. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. And, and, and uh, I, I think you, you would be really, really proud of Science of Happiness, which has become such a, such a powerful, powerful uh, yeah. platform. Yeah, no, thanks for bringing that up. I totally forgot about that. Um, so... <laughs> You know, and it's funny, you know, I've been teaching happiness at UC Berkeley um, for 10 years, and then Jason, our director of programs, came to me and he said, you know, we should do a MOOC, a massive online open class, or whatever it stands for, and um, I was really skeptical, to be quite honest. In fact, I think my first response was, you know, that's a bad idea, it's not going to work. <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I have to tell you, um, you know, the... First of all, it, it brings together the strengths of the center, which is we have these amazing, we have 15 years of essays written by some of the most interesting people on this science, you know, and, and when you dive into the website, it is like a, it is like a, a, an adventure or a journey through just incredible insights. Um, and then, you know, the, just the, kind of the content of the course what it did, and it, and it was a just a, a game changer for the sun, the center, and really transformed it. Which is suddenly we're having conversations around the world, you know, with people like you and with individuals in Mexico. I, I gave a talk recently, and this woman came to my talk, and she's like, she stood up, and she said, you know, I'm from Mexico. She was like 60, 
And you know, I was in college 40 years ago, and this class changed my life. <laughs> yeah. um, so we're now in a conversation with people all over the world, and you know, 500,000 people at all. Um, so it's been uh, a remarkable journey, and what we're most excited about is that people can take the class, and they can create what is right for their context, right? So someone like you, you're already doing it. You know, school teachers are saying, oh, I'll teach some of this in my class, right, and show students parts of it. So uh, it's, it's just been an incredible amplifier to our work. From one mass amplifier to another, the movie Inside Out, how did that come about? Where did it start? <laughs> my mind is um, because content is playing such a huge role in our lives 
uh, and, and even more in the last few years. Uh, do you think it would warrant uh, a move, movement or an initiative where uh, filmmakers are in constant dialogue with people like you to get the right uh, science behind what they portray? Because uh, at the end of the day, when I, when I look at, I mean, if I go back to my own teenage years, I used to build humongous fantasies of what an ideal world is out there and you know where is my life and when will I get there and it's only it's only late in the years that one realizes that you know all of it was cooked up I mean the, these were just story the, these were different kind of stories being told uh, yeah. so do, do you think fiction needs revision a little bit well I I, I think um
says there are these two ways that we understand the world, narrative and science. And, you know, narrative is myth and legend and religious stories and writing and film and maybe music. And, and then science is proof and evidence and deduction and hypotheses. And, and we need them both. And, and occasionally there is this intersection between them. Um, and, and it gets fascinating. I probably writers should they always write first. Interesting. Staying, staying with emotion, um, uh, have you been following the work of Lisa Feldman Barrett? Uh, she, no. Yeah. So, how much do you think is emotion socially constructed? Or, I, I know from some of your work that uh, you believe that emotion is, is, is a complex phenomena. It has several, it has, it, if you go granular on emotion, there are several layers, cascades. Uh, can you can you can you help us a little more in in terms of understanding emotion? How would you describe somebody about uh, the word uh, or the scientific view of emotions? Sure. So you know, and I have a textbook, Understanding Emotions. And we're you know currently thinking this through. So um, so when let's say that you feel a burst of sympathy. Right? You see somebody who is really struggling that you care for and you feel this rush of an emotion that Darwin wrote about, you know, that I write about before to be good. Sympathy is our strongest instinct. You want to help us. And that's an emotional state. It's brief. It's focused on a particular cause. It has a ten, uh, sort of an inclination to act associated with it. And then the complexity of emotion is that you have to look at multiple processes that are involved. And I think that a big class of the processes trace back in our primate and mammalian evolution. And I'll just briefly talk about them. And they're, they're, you know, there's a good degree of universality in them. So those include things like you have this vagus nerve response to things that are suffering that we've documented in the lab. The vagus nerve, the largest bundle of nerves, it's mammalian. Primates have it. Uh, it probably promotes caregiving behavior. Um, you have activation in old regions of the brain, like the periodontal gray and parts of the ventral strait, and that sort of make you feel movement, make you move towards somebody who's suffering. You have movements in vocalization where you're all oh, right that we've documented are pretty universal, uh, and in fact the gray apes show a, kind of an expressive component to that. Your body may move, and skeletal muscle movements may move, occur. And, and so those things of expression and bodily movement and what we call peripheral physiology in the body and central nervous system physiology, uh, you know, a lot of the data, like we're about to publish a paper uh, showing, um, you know, in five different countries, including India, when you ask people to express emotion, 20 different emotions, uh, you do these really interesting analyses where you just look at how similar are the muscle movements in the face. 50% is universal. Like, if you and I and someone in Mexico, if we see, you know, express anger, 50% of that brief expression is universal. And then what happens in human evolution, you know, is we develop these big frontal cortexes and language, 200,000 years old, um, and representation and understanding of other people and words. Um, and, and that becomes this prompt, uniquely human layer to emotional experience. And that's largely uh, what the constructivist study is language. They don't really study physiology or expression that well or that much. Um, and that, you're going to see more variation, right? Although, um, you know, you're going to see that cultures use different metaphors to describe emotion, or they have different numbers of words. Uh, they have words, states that you know, that they may prioritize that we don't in the English language prioritize. So there, there's variation, but it's important to remember that layer to emotion is new, right? It's, it's hominid, it's in certain regions of the brain, there will be variation in how we, and that's where a lot of the construction takes place. And then I think that the construction also takes place in um, kind of the social performance of emotion. So if I'm Italian, Southern Italian, I might use more gestures and, you know, be more dramatic and it's intensified. And if I'm from, you know, a region in, you know, Canada with the, you know, the 
Inuits, that it's it's more quiet, calm. Um, so I think that you know, the, as is always the case in science, um, parts you know there are truths to both sides. That there is a big chunk of emotion that's pretty universal, and then there are pieces of it that are culturally varying. I'm actually reminded of one of the studies that you you cited in in the science of happiness, where the science of touch, and I think we yeah. I think you cited that how different people in Russia in different parts of the world uh, touch each other the number of times yeah. so they differ uh, in 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 the number of times that they touch their that the person that they're meeting. Yeah. Oh no, it's, it's comical, you know. So in England, uh, friends touch each other. No, it, it, I think it's Puerto Rico, very expressive culture a hundred times yes. and then you go and then you walk friends talk to each other for 15 minutes the same unit of observation and they touch each other zero times right <laughs> yeah. but that tells you something which is that the friends probably are, are having similar processes happening in the brain and the peripheral nervous system and maybe oxytocin is involved and they show subtle movements in the face that signal I like you and in an expressive culture they're performing it with more touch uh, and in a less expressive culture like England, uh, you don't see the touch. So um, both are true in that instance. Yeah, and also mindful of your time. We are al- almost approaching forty-five minutes, Dakar. So one option is I can seek Which another. So, yeah. So the, yeah, I have a few more questions. So I was wondering if if you would like to give me some more time, not now, but some other time in the next ten days, uh, when we can have uh, a, a round of twenty twenty-five minutes of conversation. Well, let's, let's finish it up today because I have to go out of the country. So. Oh, okay, okay. Let's do that. So let's come to uh, the the next big thing that you that you that you came out with recently, the power paradox. Uh, yeah. And how do you define the central hypothesis, uh, uh, the the power paradox? So the power paradox is sort of surveying, you know, thirty years of study of power by influence over other people. And, and the paradox pertains to two different questions, which is how do I get power, right? How do I influence people at work? Um, if I'm in a firm, how do I get centrally involved in the social network and be at the hub of innovation? If I'm with my family, how do I get my teenagers to listen, you know, and be good people in the world? And, and the first principle is largely that we gain power and influence in the world, be it an organization or a scientific community or a family or a neighborhood, by lifting up the greater good, right? And this principle you see in hunter-gatherer societies, you see in schools with kids and, you know, organizations. We get power by sharing resources, by being bold with ideas and, and giving away innovations and connecting to others and really building up strong social networks um, is and, and this you know um, was really nicely articulated by the philosopher Hannah Arendt who said you know that your power really resides in the network of people you're connected to and 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 when you think when you study who innovates in a firm right it usually is the person who's not only creative, but connected to a lot of people, building strong ties, great ideas are flowing to them, your ideas are being enacted by others. So we get power by lifting up the greater good. Um, and there are even radical tests of this hypothesis that we gain influence and power by sharing, right? By signs of sympathy or compassion. And here comes the paradox, which is that regrettably, once we have power and we feel at the top of a hierarchy or we feel the hubris of success, right, the excessive pride, then we lose those skills that got us power in the first place. And, you know, we did all these studies showing that once you feel powerful, um, you listen to people less effectively. You are less empathetic. You are more likely to prioritize your own greed over the needs of other people. We did these funny studies of, you know, people driving in the United States, and if you're driving a powerful car like a BMW, you're more likely to drive through a part of the street where pedestrians have the right of way. You're driving dangerously, right? So, you know, this is always the tension.
ancient and human history, which is great people rise to power and do so by inspiring a lot of people, and then they lose that very skill, those skills that got them power in the first place. As you were speaking, I was just thinking that if I look at my own self today, uh, and I look at people around me, and in some sense, if I were to say that I am at a certain place, for just for argument's sake, then there would be some people that I would reach out to, and I believe if I get the access to yeah. them, they would help me in my life, or it would help yeah. me. And there would be some people who would be my peers, and then there would be some people who would be wanting to reach to me. So at any given point of time, I would have primarily three categories of people. I want to reach them, I want to beat them, and they want to reach to me. And yeah. what what I what I can make sense, uh, at least understand from what you're saying is, my focus is how do I get there, and as far as the people who want to reach to me, uh, you know, I don't care. I mean, I'm here, and so maybe what you're saying is that people they keep rising the hierarchies, or rising the power positions, and uh, the focus is to get above and forget or sort of ignore whatever is below, sort of. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think that that is one of the dynamics, which is that, you know, you you navigate social hierarchies. And in, in the power paradox, I, I really make it clear that, you know, power isn't just politics, it's about kids at school, right? Kids who are bullied are suffering from the power paradox. Um, power is about um, innovation in scientific communities, right? You're rising in a hierarchy of ideas, and how do you really contribute to it? Um, and um, the, you know, so the dynamic that, that maps onto what you're talking about, Hamas, is that when you navigate it, and when you rise in social hierarchies, and this is even seen in primates, not human primates, you are really carefully taking in the wisdom of people around you or other individuals. And they are people who are in low status positions, higher status positions. You're just absorbing all this information about how do I make it in this particular hierarchy, right? What 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 are the competencies that are required? How do I build strong ties? And then ironically, what the data show is that once I'm higher up at the top, a lot of people lose this, or they just lose sight of the fact that they still need to listen carefully. They still need to get the wisdom of people at the bottom. They still need to get the wisdom of people who are their peers. And, you know, there are these amazing studies showing that, you know, people at the top, um, they um, communicate in a way that prevents them from getting wisdom. They interrupt. They shut people down. They stop affiliating with people who are below them so they're not getting the fresh insights of younger people or people who are, you know, really hungry to develop new ideas. Um, and I think that, you know, in my teaching in organizations these past 15 years, there are a lot of costs to that style. And then by contrast, you know, I've noticed that the great innovator, someone like Pete Docter, who made Inside Out, he, he doesn't care who he's getting information from. He's humbly taking in the wisdom on an hourly basis of the people around him, right? And that's what makes him great. So it's a... Um, it's a really interesting dynamic that is right at the heart of whether you'll make a difference in the world. Interesting. Uh, so last couple, so I, 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 have a few, I have a few questions around mindfulness. One of the things that I can do is I can send you out an email and if you can answer them, there are two or three questions sure. specific to mindfulness. Uh, yeah. And on the close... Oh so let me take a shot. Sorry, what is that? I have nine minutes, so... Okay, so we'll do, we'll do that. So... Uh, I, I remember from some of your uh, conversations on, 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 on audio and video where uh, you cite the, uh, that you are a practitioner of mindfulness or meditation in some way. Can you just uh, help, help us understand uh, how did you get to mindfulness and, and, and you know what has stuck with you? Are there any specific practices that you gave up over a period of time and some are more, uh, more sticking with you? Yeah, so I, I got to mindfulness the awareness in a non, non-judgmental fashion of what's happening in your nervous system and your social environment really through my teenage years and early adulthood of studying different kinds of 
Buddhism and Taoism and Hinduism, and, you know, and then really practicing yoga, um, which I've practiced for uh, 35 years um, on a regular basis. Um, and and then also, you know, in backpacking and getting out into the woods and thinking about the people who find mindfulness in nature. And, and so I had this foundation. And then along comes the, the contemplative science movement or the mindfulness movement of Richie Davidson and John Kabat-Zinn and all these folks um, who are interested in it. And, and then what we teach at the Greater Good Science Center. And what I, building out of that life history of study, and I, I've never been a really devoted meditator where I've never meditated for hours a day. But what I, I do do and I take from the Greater Good Science Center is there are, first of all, the breath, right? The deep breathing and, and the patterns of breathing and the awareness of breath that's at the heart of all these traditions. And we know scientifically that that calms the stress response, activates the vagus nerve, gets you into a good state. So I make sure I'm breathing a lot each day, counting and at different moments in the day. And then you layer on top of that um, awareness of the emotions I study, like loving kindness or awe or gratitude, right? What do I feel really grateful for? And I'll breathe and think about three things that I'm grateful for. Then you can direct mindfulness to the outside environment, right? And so on, especially because I study awe and nature um, and happen. Northern California is beautiful, as, as you saw, lots of trees and hills and mountains, is to reflect on how beautiful nature is, right, in a mindful way. And then the thing that I'm really excited about Yamat is, and I think it's undervalued in the mindfulness literature, is to mindfully direct your attention to how incredible other human beings are, right, and to think about mindful awareness of other people's wisdom or their faces or their kindness, right, and, and because I've studied the human face, for 25 years, the big parts of the brain are devoted to really looking mindfully at the human face and to listen to the voice and do things like empathic listening. So, so I would say that you know when you put that array of practices together, and I've just charted mindful breath and mindful kindness and gratitude and mindful awareness of others in the environment. To me, I've got about eight or ten things, and I'm doing three or four each day, right? Wow. And it's only eight to ten minutes, um, but, you know, I know you had Meng on uh, in your show, and I really, you know, he makes this point that just do it a few minutes a day, you know? And I agree. I think if you can just build it into your habits, um, then you'll just feel it popping up when you're doing the dishes or talking to your child, right? And, and that's what I try to do. Amazing. <laughs> Amazing. Um, so, couple of last questions. Uh, what are you reading nowadays? Well, you know, what I'm reading is um, um, the I a lot of different things, right? So, my reading feeds into my science, uh, feeds into writing textbooks and new books. Um, so I, you know, I've, I've been really interested in um, the deep principles of yoga and the qi gong tradition and um, Chinese traditions and the body, right? Like, what is it about? How do we? We often underemphasize the body, right? In mindful traditions, we think about the mind and other people, and but man, your body is is a a carrier of health and happiness, and so. What do they have to say about the Bali traditions? I've been really interested in epigenetics, um, you know, the processes at the cellular level that um, uh, shape the expression of genes. It's kind of been a revolution. And it, I mean, it's, been a big, it's the emergence of a revolution. Um, I have been interested uh, in how do we counter bullies and tyrants and coercive power. Um, you know, one of the things that happened in writing the power paradox, I wrote it before Trump, um, and it was this optimistic view of power, right? 
It's like you get power and keep it by kindness and being good to others. And then along comes an example of somebody who is the counter of that, right? He is all about himself. He speaks in a bullying fashion. And, and our scientific literature has for a long time, and I write a little bit about this in the Power Paradox, known that human societies are really struggles between coercive, selfish power that seeks to harm and then collaborative, compassionate power that seeks to build and, and grow. And that is a, a continual struggle. Um, and we're in a moment of it very acutely here in the United States, right, of coercive Trump-like power versus... Well, there's a lot of collaborative, kind power in the United States. And so I've just been thinking about how do we take on coercive power in, in the workplace, right? How do you develop mindful practices to say... Hey, you can't bully me, you know, and I will counter coercion with kindness. Um, and I think that's a really important message that we have to stay close to today is to rise above it. So I've been thinking, reading a lot about tyranny and bullying and the like. Um, and, you know, I'm, I'm gearing up to write about awe, which is our lab is really interested in awe and uh, and just all the great traditions that do that. And then I always read about human happiness. Wow. Uh, what is one question or a few questions, or let's say just one question, that you wish you had an answer to? Oh, God. Um, uh, well... You know, it's been so interesting, Himan. Um, you know, I think being so, you know, I've been part of the science and then the Greater Good Science Center of trying to figure out, like, where do these things that are so sacred, right? Um, compassion, sympathy, awe, gratitude, kindness, um, beauty, your sense of joy, you know, where do those come from? in the evolutionary, evolutionary story of our species. You know, and you and I have talked about this, and yeah, it's been, I mean, we still have so many questions about how that works, right? You know, where does the human capacity for art and beauty come from? Um, and we're starting to get some, some pictures of that, but, but, you know, what is a mystery in the human literature and and it, it pertains to our science and our conversation today. And one of your questions you asked earlier, which is that, you know, humans have this amazing symbolic capacity, and we tell stories, and we use words, abstract symbols, to describe experience. And it is really the foundation of culture in some ways. And there is some kind of transition that happens in primates to humans and primates have a lot of the vocalizations to express things. They threaten display and show kindness and have vocalizations for food. And they, they're using these referential uh, expressions. But the question is, is how do we go from that platform of ex expression and, and reference to what we do in human language? Um, and, and, you know, once we understand that, then we can start to understand stories and narratives and fiction, which you talked about, and legend and, and art and ritual, and we, we don't know. <laughs> so I'm trying to be part of a, a, a partial solution to that question. Super, uh, Dacker. Uh, just the last bit of the closing. Any poem or a quote that, that really, really moved you recently? A poem or a quote that moved you recently? Yeah, you know, I, I, I mean, I um, so often, you know, and I teach my students in human happiness, um, and I think I'm really, and I would encourage your listeners to, and, and readers to send me their favorite quotes. I would love that. Um, and they could send it over email, calhernberkeley.edu. Um, because I think, you know, Hinduism is probably the strongest tradition in legends and myths and stories and quotes, right? Um, and, and other cultures aren't as richly imbued with that tradition. So, you, you know, I'd love to hear your 
wisdom, but for me, um, you know, uh, I'll, I'll give you a few. One is, you know, when I read Charles Darwin's uh, Sympathy is Our Strongest Instinct, and communities with the most sympathetic members will flourish, uh, I literally, my jaw dropped. I, was, I just thought, wow, even in evolutionary science, compassion is our strong defining characteristic. Uh, the poet Percy Shelley uh, has this like, quote where he says that the great secret of morals is love. And in going out of our own nature and an identification of the beautiful that exists in thought, action, or person, not our own. And what he is saying is that the great secret of morals and getting along and meaning is getting out of your own head and identifying what's amazing about other people. Um, you know, when I wrote The Power Paradox, that's the central message of The Power Paradox is we all have to grapple with influence and power, and we want to have good power. And our mind will lead us astray, and the secret is to get out of your own head and to stay focused on the beauty of other people. So I love that quote as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dako, for your time. I extended it beyond the earlier permitted time, but I'm so thankful that you gave this time to us and your words of wisdom. Thank you so much, Dako. It is always great to talk to you, Dako. Thank you so much. You have a nice day, Dako. You too. See you soon. See you. See you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.